So today we will talk about chapter four, scanning. We, this is the first step of any kind of compilers or interpreters or really kind of any kind of program that's dealing with text input, like structured text input. So the scanner takes in raw source code as a series of char characters and groups it into a series of chunks we call tokens. That's why sometimes scanner is also called uh, tokenizer and another name is lexer. It all means the kind of same thing. Like as this aside says scanning, lexing, lexical analysis, all talking about the same thing. And the scanning is pretty easy. But it also simplifies the whole parsing process a lot. So it is possible to not do any scanning, just directly parse character by character into an AST, but abstract syntax tree. But that can be much more difficult. So that's, that's why we have a separate chapter on scanning. And this is also what compilers usually, compilers and interpreters usually do. Also, I think scanning is the only phase that looks at every character in the input stream. So it, it needs to be fast. It is relatively yeah. easy to write a scanner, but uh, to write an efficient scanner can be hard. And uh, it's it's very important because that can be the bottleneck in case we have a sufficiently simple grammar that is easy to parse. Yeah, yeah. It depends. It depends on what kind of thing we are dealing with. If it's super fast, then certainly not bottleneck. But if let's say we are parsing JSON, then this can be really important to make scanning really fast you can also report error you can also report errors earlier which is part of the fast thing but like since it's faster you can get the obvious errors out faster yeah yeah we can catch some errors in this stage so don't need to yeah don't need to go into the next stage some of it means no matter how complex your tokens are, uh, it's probably the most difficult part of many scanners is scanning numbers if you include uh, floating point and e-notation and this, that, and the other, especially if you also include things like complex numbers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they, are, they are like, complicated algorithms of doing that, that we will definitely not cover. We will just cover simple stuff. Probably using the standard library to parse numbers. So this is the first time we see the code. And so before the scanning, we need some like boilerplate and because it's Java, we can see a lot of those <laughs> kind of stuff. And we, our main function, we take the array of arguments. And if we have multiple arguments, then we see it's an error because we only allow one argument as a file name. So if it only have one argument, we run it as a file. Otherwise, we run it as a repo. We, we just run a loop and 
ask user to input some code. This yes, is also. Oh, sorry. Go on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Go on. Oh, um, I learned in this chapter the origins behind REPL. Like I knew what it stand for, but there's a there's a side note in this chapter that it's actually just named after how you would write it in Lisp. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that's it. Yeah. I had a similar like mind blown moment when I think that's similar with uh, grep as well. So it's just a fun fact. Actually, yeah, I, I think I think one of the nice thing about these books is so far anyway is all the little side notes and footnotes. Uh, yeah, it's quite nice. Yeah, I I really like his side. But yeah, this is design notes. This section is even better. It's just all those kind of little stuff. I really like. Yeah. So for the run, run file, we basically just read a, read the a file and then to a string and then run the string. We just pass it into this run function, which is the most important function. For the repo, we have a loop and then just read some inputs and then pass it into, pass it into the run function. It's the same except the case if we have some interrupt uh, with the keyboard, something like that, we will get now in this case with this read line function. In that case, we break out of the loop. And finally, for the run function, we haven't actually implemented eval this kind of stuff. So what we actually do is just create a scanner and tokenize the source uh, string into a token, yeah, into a list of tokens, and then just print those tokens. Then, then the book started talking a little bit about error handling because when something when something goes wrong, we need to report something. And the book used a really simple approach where we just report a line number plus some string. Where an yeah, actual useful interpreter will probably need to report some more stuff. But, but with a line number, I think it's bare minimum. And it, it already improved the situation a lot by giving the line number. So the error, the error message will be look like this. Uh, but it will be unexpected semicolon, but add some line number. And that bo the book mentioned, ideally we want an error message like this, where we print the line. But this is a pretty nasty piece of code to implement. I, I actually implemented this thing before from scratch, it's hard. So, and it's not very exciting kind of code. It's just like manipulating strings. So the books will skip that. A comment. Yeah. If someone happens to do the implementation in Rust, there is a nice library. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but shouldn't you write the library yourself? Isn't it, isn't it the point of the book? No, no, no. It's a Rust library. 
it's yeah, it kind of gives this kind of output. It's really nice. I don't know if this is only library or not, because I remember there is a Rust library for this, but I don't know if this this one. Yeah, there's also there a nice be... library. I'll I'll see if I can find it and put it in the chat. So I, I think if you use libraries for like nicely formatting output messages or so on, you still implement the lexer yourself. I, I think it's still in the spirit of the book. Yeah, I agree. I, I haven't looked at the library. I don't know what it does for you, but like if you can give it like, I guess the offsets and the string and it'll look those up, uh, I don't know. This is like cosmetic change. It doesn't kind of you. You are not using the library to implement a parser, for example. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like I, now that I think about it, it's probably like if the library is like that, then it's not a big deal, right? Because it's just yeah. yeah, it's just taking over some of that manual labor. And then the book use a really simplistic approach to indicate whether a code has the error or not, just a Boolean field. And if it has an error, we just exit with some number. And for repo, after we run it blank, we say we don't have error anymore. So, so this is necessary things. Sometimes there can be multiple errors we want to report at once. And if we don't do this kind of things, instead, let's say throw an exception or like using a type like result, which is either something or an error, then we kind of just stuck at the when we meet the first error. So, so that is, that's why the book uses this approach. And uh, he also mentioned like in yeah, actual abstraction, we can have some kind of error reporter interface that, that can like, for example, report error differently in a command line or in IDE, but for our interpreter, we will just not do that. So now let's look at this simple piece of code. This, uh, this code, we have a bunch of white spaces and tokenizing just is the process of splitting the white spaces and group characters together. So we have var, language, equal, and this string, and semicolon. All of them are different folks, uh, tokens. <laughs> and the book mentioned we when group characters into tokens, we also have some other useful information and we can bundle them together to a token. The first useful information is the type of a token. So when we're dealing with a parser, we don't need to like read the string again and say, oh, it's a var. Instead, we can directly say certain tokens just have a type that like those uh, operators uh, or keywords and 
and the string and numbers all have like unique types. This also also means for stuff like numbers, we don't need to uh, we don't need to pass them twice because we can just uh, we can just like pass them once and store the value in the token rather than pass it in the lexer and then in the parser pass them again. Then what's remaining is identifier. It's just some string that's used to represent a name. Some people might disagree with the comment. I imagine most people would not say identifiers are literals. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I've never yeah, heard identifier used said that that's a literal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I feel like this is a weird. I would put identifier into its own category instead of like put them together with string and numbers. I think I think it's because in terms of parsing, it parses like a number and like a string, right? It's a bunch of characters that ends at you know at some predefined, you know, after a space or something. And so yeah, I think that's why he did that. Yeah, it's just because it's the same type of parsing, but it's not it's not a literal, but it's a kind of parsing that's like the other uh, literals. Yeah, this this chapter's approach is uh, pass identifiers with keyword, which makes sense because, like, identifier is basically everything that is not a everything have this pattern, but is not a keyword is an identifier. Actually, it's a bit more than that because an identifier does not include punctuation or other say symbols like semicolon or equal and so on. It's really yeah. closer to being a name. Yeah, uh, he separated those as operators, so. Well, what identifiers has um, in, have in common with strings and numbers is there are, a, each is a class of things, while let's say yeah. a keyword is exactly one, one in this enum is one keyword, while mm. identifiers, there are many different identifiers, uh, all uh, assigned to the enum um, uh, identifier. So that's why, that's probably what he means here with literals there. That's a, a group of different things uh, under one enum uh, um, type, under one mm. enum thing. Yeah, yeah, I that makes sense. That. Yeah. But then we, when he actually talked about literals, he mentioned numbers and string and no identifiers. I guess it's just some inconsistent thinking in here. So each token also have location information because when we report error, we need to know where the error happened. In this case, in this case, we only stored the line number, but it can also be useful to store the column number so we know where exactly it happens, but his error reporting doesn't have a column, so we just store the nine number. Usually when you do these sort of things, what you want to point at is the beginning of the thing that was a token and the error message is saying, okay, I thought it was going to be this kind of a token, but it's not. And you want to yeah. point at the thing you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah, it's, we talk about, we talk about like this style of error reporting get a lot popular now. 
it's just pointy exactly like that. Yeah, <clears throat> it's weird that he calls that out in the beginning. And then also later we track like the start, like where our cursor is at the start and the line number. But then for some reason in the token, we only store the line number. When it's like, but we already have where it, it starts. So we could also just put that in the token as well. Yeah, but yeah, you, you can certainly do that. I guess it's if we don't want to like pretty printing, it's just a lot of, another number, which is not too much to add. Even though like column number by itself is not very useful. We like we need to count columns like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's not that useful. We need something like pretty printing like that to make it actually useful. I guess that's why he didn't put it here. I mean, but also the column can be helpful too. Like it knows, like a lot of editors, you can like just put in a column number and it'll take it there. Like in Vim, if you're on like the make thing, you can just look at the column and then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of editors have that. Hmm. And then, then he he talks a little bit about just just kind of the the job of the our scanner is consume each individual characters and then kind of generate tokens with <laughs> with this. <laughs> this image and then he started to talk about this concept may sound familiar because match some match some patterns and then the, just this idea of matching patterns is exactly like a regular expression regex so for example, we can specify the identifiers like this as a regex. It says it's either some uh, alphabetic, yeah, yeah, uh, or underscore or like and then it's for the leading character, and then it's just a bunch of alphabetic or numeric numbers or underscore for the following. And, and he further comments this intuition is exactly the case. And most most programming languages, the like the token, not the tokens can be classified as a regular language where we can just scan it through and and then use this kind of regular expression to match each tokens. And that's why there are tools like Lex or Flex. That exactly using regex to generate lexer for us. There are some interesting cases, though. Think about why, for example, in C, we don't allow nested, nested uh, nested comment. Sorry, because nested comment is no longer regular, I guess. So if you do with comment in the scanning phase, then there are no regex can match nested comments. Then, then the book starts to put the a scanner class. 
Mm. You can see this code is pretty imperative. We store several states and then in a class and then we muted them because the scanner is kind of like a generator, I guess. I guess in this implementation, it can be just a pure function, but also since it's Java, not some functional language, it decided to use this approach. Some alternative material for interpreters in Rust. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, some something different in that approach. I appreciate that comment. And and the source is actually our input, even though we just store them as a field in the class. And then the tokens are output. So for the scan tokens, we just do a while loop. While we haven't reached the end, we we set some start and the current, which is just our locations inside the string. And then we scan each scan token until we reach the end. And we, we, add, we add a UF token at the end and returns. The end of file UF token is just used for making the parsing process a little bit cleaner. So I, I think this kind of thing uh, like in design pattern is called no object pattern. So using an actual object to kind of replace now to make things easier to handle. And, and then we can, we still need, need those, this field start and current are like this, are like the location where our, where our scanning. Notice this start is not a start of the tokens. It's the, it's like both of those are just used in the scanning process. And the lines and line number. And we also have is add end function, which just say whether our current cursor location is greater than the length, greater than or equal to. Then the book start to deal with the simplest case for. We first have this advance, which just consume one character. And if this character, if this character is all of those, all of those characters, we know it's a single character token. We just directly add add them, and we can bridge from the switch and. We just end with the switch token, but a uh, scan token, but we will add more stuff later. And notice notice that we don't have the divide symbol, but we will cover it later. And we have a bunch of helpers, advance, which just consume one token, add token. This is just uh, like kind of uh, 
because Java doesn't have default argument. I don't know if it's still the case. Sorry. But this is basically make this literal now. And most of cases is like this, but for certain cases, usually for like a uh, string or number, we don't want to pass them twice. So we can just store the information directly into a token with this literal. Yeah, I guess this is like the Java way of doing it. I don't know if Java has better way to do it, but like in other languages where you can have like some types, then instead of having to just have every token have like an optional literal field, your tokens could just be like a some type of the different literal or of the of the different types of token. Yeah, yeah. yeah actually, depending on what the language is like that you want to write the scanner for, in case of C++, for example, after pre-processing, I saw files, pre-processed files that were like hundreds of megabytes in size. And processing all the data in the compiler is, is not easy without running out of memory and running forever. So what many C++ compilers are doing, they're trying to deduplicate de things as much as possible. So if, you, if the same identifier is mentioned multiple times, they don't store the actual text to that identifier multiple times. So if you have, for example, uh, so many C++ classes have, have begin and end uh, methods to get the iterators and uh, you don't want to store that text as many times, uh, as many times that identifier is mentioned throughout your code. Are you talking about like string internally, stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, string internally is kind of optimization to just in case we have those very large literals and repeated multiple times, we don't want to store them multiple times. Yeah, so you can do that with other stuff beyond string. Well, I guess their their string is in the compiler, but yeah, things like um, things like identifiers you can do that with. I know like the JVM does that internally as well. Yeah, like in the the bytecode does that with all like the different class names and packages and whatnot. Yeah, you can you can do that pretty easily in your own Java code too with libraries like Google's Guava library has a, an intern or you can just pass your string into it and it'll intern it for you. Yeah, so we are already kind of 10 steps ahead of this book we're talking about optimizations. But I guess this book will not talk about optimizations until maybe the last chapter. Uh, then, then if we can't match any characters we want, we just report some error. Unexpected character. That's not nice. At least print what character it is. Yeah. <laughs> and that's actually no. what I did in mind. Cause like the problem is that, like, I mean, because you could print the character, especially if it's one character, because like it's what you're switching on, but I don't know. I, I added that in my in my interpreter because it was really easy. You literally you just put the character at the end and then you're you're good. Yeah. Yeah. If, if we have pretty printing, then we don't need to print that character because it's already pretty printed. Yeah. It's but this is a low. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, really I yeah. I suspect, I don't know if this is true, but I suspect that maybe the author 
he puts like really low hanging fruit like this in the book on purpose so that way people will people will be tempted to like go a little bit outside the the bounds of the book and add something extra themselves yeah yeah good point I felt that way too with not reporting the line number, like not having, or sorry, not reporting the the column number, had not yeah. having to the token. I felt that way too. Yeah, uh, reporting the column number, I guess, just besides the error reporting, it's also useful for testing. Yeah, that's actually something that I wanted to talk about. I guess once we finish summarizing the chapter, I wanted to talk about how people were testing their stuff so far. But, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We can talk about after after we are done with this chapter. So, notice that we keep scanning. Because we want to report all the error at once with our uh, scanner. We don't want to just stop at the first error. And that's why we have that Boolean flag. And then the book start to talk about longer characters. Um, longer, sorry, not longer characters, longer tokens. Like for two character tokens, then we need to do some extra work like this. So there is this match helper function, which is conditionally consume a character if it match this. And so this code is really imperative. And if we want to write functionally, it will be very different way, but the idea is here that say if we if our current character is not the not the expected character we just return. Otherwise we consume that character. And we also return we return whether we consume the character or not. So in this case, if we consume ban and also equal, we know it's not equal. So we say it's ban equal token. Otherwise we just say it's only a ban token, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, something that I thought was interesting is that when I was first reading this, I thought that like, I thought that this part was like particularly messy and like the imperative, as you were saying, and I was like, you know, something like a peak or something would, would make more sense here. And then in the next section, he, he implements a peak method. So I thought he could have added the peak method to like match. Uh. We can add a peak to, like, yeah, I guess this is, yeah, this is peak, but yeah, you're right. So, and then he, he added a peak later, so it's, I guess because it's book order, he presents this code first. That's why he will not use peak. Yeah. Um, um, and for for peak, oh, but also peak does a little bit like safety check, which is elided here. So basically, basically for comments, we just say after we we see this comments like double slash pattern, 
we just run a loop, run a loop until until we hit end of the line, end of line or end of the whole string. Otherwise, we just continue. If we don't have double slash, but we have single slash, then it's just a slash token. Because comment is kind of special, that's why we previously we don't like make this just a single slash token. Uh, just I uh, uh, just like deal with it a similar way as other single token characters. And yeah, this is a peak function. It's just, it's just this, but it does uh, out of bound check. And the book even mentioned that advanced and peaks are fundamental operations and match combines them. So match can use those two. It just didn't use them. And for, for white spaces, we just ignore them. For, for end of line, it's like white space, but we need to increase our line number. And now our scanner can handle handle stuff like this, all the operators and comments. And for string, we can see, we can kind of see the pattern here. It's like we, we see the first character and then we go into some, go into some functions. This approach is the same for lexer and parser actually. For parser is also like, we, we see the first character and then we see if the rest still match our expectations. But for the scanner, it's usually simpler. We see the first, uh, we usually don't need to backtrack. Not usually, we don't need to backtrack. We just say, we see this and then we go to the stream function. And then we just, in the stream function, we just loop until we hit another double quote. If we don't meet any double, uh, we don't need any double quote and then we already at the end, then we have an error. Otherwise, otherwise, since when we meet the second double quote, we already quit this loop. We missed, uh, we still have a double quote to skip. So like this. And finally, we just add all the characters in between into the token. And and for number number literals, we I guess we don't do too complicated stuff like all the number literals are not in C, but instead we just do either this or this. So either a whole number or something follows a digit. Sorry, for a dot and then some other digits. We don't allow, allow this or those, even though th this is allowed in some languages. This this one this one is a bit weird, especially if you talk about you talk about if we want to support something like this, then 
kind of weird if we kind of scan this part as a number. Well, he's saying that you can't do that. Yeah, you but can. I, yeah. It's just problematic. This well, I'm is, saying this in this language, invalid. like it's invalid in this language, but yeah, you could. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's weird is that most languages wouldn't even let you do that anyways. Like to add a met, like to add a, a method to a number literal like that. Most of the times, you still have to wrap it in parentheses, at least in most of the yeah. languages. Which I don't really get why, actually. Now that I, I, I never thought about it until I read this chapter, but like, if identifiers can't start with numbers which in most languages they can't, then actually something like this, like this example could make sense. But in every language I know of, you still have to wrap it in parentheses. Not just parentheses. Usually you need to, like in Java, you need to actually box it into an object because number is special. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's because it doesn't have any methods on it. But I'm saying yeah. you know, where numbers can have methods like for example in javascript right you can do like two string or whatever on numbers but you have to wrap the number literal in parens before you can like call dot two string or something oh oh i don't know that interesting yeah in languages like like java or something or c plus plus then that doesn't make sense but that's just because but that's not that's not a parsing thing, right? Because even if you assigned it to a variable, you still couldn't. Yeah. It. Yeah. I think Rust can do that. Scala definitely supports method. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Scala. Like literals, but because... I don't know if Scala supports this or you need parentheses or not. Well, I think in Scala, couldn't you just define a, a function called dot? I mean, you might need a space between the dot and the square root. But yeah. if you can have a function called dot, then you can do that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Rust and Scala can do that just fine. And We just see if the character is the number, is a digit, and then we go into this number parting part. Note, note that its digit is also a peak operation. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, actually consume any character because if we consume the character here and then we go to number, we lost one character. And, and then we just scan the whole number literal and then use the standard library function. So we actually still parse the number twice, once in like once in here, and then use the standard library because, because this is not that trivial to implement anymore. So you just decide to skip that. And also there is a peak next helper function, which is like peak with still with a bound checking and and then just pick the next character. Because in because in here when you do check like look ahead two characters at once or dot and another it need to be a digit. Yeah, it's weird how sometimes he uses 
peak next and advance, and then other times he uses match. Because those do kind of similar yeah. things, but in match, it will it will conditionally not um, increment the the uh, the offset, right? The cursor, but you could also do that same thing with peak next in advance, and I feel like that makes more sense. But... Not peak next is peak and advance, not peak next. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, I guess it's just like peak and advance does some extra like safety check and match because you know this doesn't need to do those kind of checks. But otherwise, yeah, otherwise match is base, basically the combination of those two functions. I think the the way he implements the peak next is uh, actually pretty ugly. Sort of always checking uh, that the length, uh, yeah, that it fits in the length. So I think it would be nicer to utilize something like is at n is is the is at end function or something like that. Um, yeah. I think it's okay. At the end, this is just an abstraction. Then who cares if this for this like if it's ugly, if we just use pick next. Right. And then then they kind of start to do the similar stuff for the for the each different character, different characters. But I guess he need to first, um, first match the character is uh, alphabetic. It's a letter or underscore, I guess. If it is the case, we can go to the identifier function where where we where we peak and we just see if the remaining character is either a letter underscore or number then then we say it's an identifier but then in this case we also match all the keywords so we will add some stuff in here later to deal with keyword and there's some help function when it's basically saying the character is either a letter or a underscore. And uh, then it's either letter, underscore, or a digit. And at the end, he decided to just put keywords instead of using the previous, with the previous like switch this approach is that to just put uh, all the keywords into a hash table, which he can actually do that for, for those operators too, but he decided to use different approach for keywords and operators. And since all the keywords are in the hash table, we just, We just kind of immediately know whether at in the identifier function, we can know if uh, we have a text and then we can immediately know our, whether our text belong to this group of keywords. And if, if it is, then it's a keyword. Otherwise we say it's an identifier. Yeah, well also most compilers will will optimize that like switch thing to be like a jump table or something anyways. Yeah, yeah, switch will definitely be optimized. This probably not. Yeah. 
Yeah, so if you want fast, then probably you need some ugly switch. And actually he did ugly switch in the second part of the book, because in C, you don't have this available. Also, like in production, production uh, scanner, we also need to deal with like Unicode. This book doesn't talk about it at all, which is fine. Yeah, I like to break software by putting emoji in places, and this is very. So far, the scanner is already breakable with emoji. So. <laughs> there are some challenges, like the lexical grammars of Python and Haskell are not regular. Why? I feel like it has something to do. Like I said, the next comment is one way to make the grammar not regular. I don't I know what. For, for Python, I think I read it's because of the uh, indentation. Ah. Uh, necessary. Okay. And it makes it so that you can't, uh, I mean, I don't know exactly why. Yeah, but. I, I don't know, actually never write an interpreter of any language that need indentation because I hate it. So I absolutely hate indentation sensitive languages. So I don't write toy languages in that fashion. So I don't even know how to parse that. <laughs> And yeah. basic way for, for parsing the indentation sensitive is you just have to keep track of how far indented you are. And yeah. if your indentation increases, you have to emit a indent token, or if it decreases a dedent token, and include that in your grammar. I think the way that Scala does it in Scala 3, because you can, for some reason, they decided to have both uh, like brace syntax and indentation syntax for some reason. And I think the way that they do it there is that they just, um, when they parse the indentation, they just sort of on the fly desugar it into uh, braces and not. So they just add the, so when you indent a level, they add an opening brace and every time you dedent, they add a closing brace in the, somewhere in the parser. Okay, yeah, that's yeah, that sounds reasonable. Yeah, to talk about this. in certain languages, white space is can be meaningful in certain situations. I guess those challenges is just like we we need to actually go read those languages to figure it out. And C style blog comment allowing them to nest, then yeah, it's no longer regular anymore. But also nested comment is pretty simple to implement. So we just need to keep track of the level basically. At the end, at the end, he talks about implicit semicolon. I really like this paragraph. I don't like the conclusion. Is that is if you are designing a new language, you almost surely should avoid the explicit statement terminator. I, I don't like this conclusion because, as he said, it's messy. Uh, if we if we don't have a explicit statement terminator, instead we just just have a, like end line as a token, and then we sometimes ignore that we will have some weird edge cases, like this one, this one, this one, and 
different languages dealing with them very differently. So, and it can sometimes cause problems, especially in the case of JavaScript. I guess that's the end of this chapter. We can stop recording and then we can just chat about stuff.